Principal Operation Manager for 15 years, he managed the transition to the digital workforce and creating new archival st storage, physical as well as digital. He has also served on uh, EC of the Sipawa as sections and helped to set up the New Zealand branch of UNESCO Memory of the World Program. Jamie has a Master of Information Management from Victoria University, and this focus on issues around the IT and archival interface. He is currently the Operations Manager for uh, New Zealand's Micrographic, digitizing heritage papers, photographs, and audiovisual material for a wide range of institutions and individuals. So this is uh, Jamie. Jackie, can you take it now? Okay, so I would like to pass the floor to Jamie presentation. Please, Jamie, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Santai. I hope people can hear me. Um, I'm here, you will. Yeah, excellent. I um, have a great sympathy. I was once in the seat that you're occupying and organizing conferences, except they weren't quite perhaps as complex as this wonderful little gather town. So thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I did spend a lot of time working for the New Zealand Film Archive and then Natonga Sound and Vision. But I just want to be clear that I am uh, not working for them anymore and I, I do not speak for Natonga Sound and Vision but I would like to share some of my experience of the la over the last uh, three decades or so of um, working with archives. Uh, so I will do a screen share, although the slideshow is not particularly spectacular. So um, and so hopefully that's working. Um, disaster and risk management is quite rightly focused on immediate and dramatic possibilities, uh, fire, flooding, um, broken pipes, you know, all of these kind of things. Um, and of course, in New Zealand, we have earthquakes. Um, the first concern is for the people, and this means strong buildings that won't completely fail and staff collection um, and safe for staff with collection management practices. But we're also concerned about the loss of collections. And in fact, that's believed to be the sole purpose of archives, to keep all the records safe. Um, however, I, I thought I'd try um, to outline a few of the less dramatic risks to audiovisual collections, the ones that may have long-term serious consequences. And these are the things that go perhaps unaddressed because they are not immediately concerning, but um, see how we go. Um, the first category there is um, distortions and disruptions. So um, the first, uh, these are just examples. There are many other types and, and sorts of distortions and disruptions, but um, one of the biggest ones we had was a massive increase in collection size. And at Sapava in 2015, I showed how the archive had grown with the addition of two large broadcast collections from radio and television. Um, this is the, this is the growth chart that I tried to do in 2009 when you try and do things like predict how big your collections will be. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's sort of a modest growth, 10% over, over the years. However, the reality uh, was somewhat different as in 2012 and then again in 2014, large collections were added. And so, just to note the change in scale. So the previous slide had the blue is the same, um, but the actual, by 2015, the actual collection was um, easily three times as much or more. Um, this did cause some issues and, and certainly shifts in focus, not least because tripling the collection size came with just a rather modest 10% increase in budget and an obligation to prioritize the two broadcasters for access to their own collections. Um, the real risks here are try in trying to integrate such large collections into the existing structure of the archive. Um, fortunately, the television collection came with its own building, um, but it did have extremely outdated management systems. In fact, the film elements, which comprise almost 100,000 or 150,000 items, was still located using a card index. And one of the first things we had to do was to migrate the existing collection database into a format readable and understandable by up-to-date computers. Meanwhile, the card index was scanned and uh, optical character recognition was used to create an electronic database. 
Uh, ironically, that was done by the company I'm now working for, so I'm still kind of related to that some, somehow. The radio broadcast collection used a completely different um, database and this still had, has to be maintained and updated. Um, the risks here are that the, the existing collection management system the archive had prior to the addition of these extra collections was already having issues as it had grown over the years. And so this hasn't really been resolved. As this database continued to have issues, the, um, the staff uh, rather lost faith in it, um, but it has yet to be um, replaced, and I'll probably come back to this. Um, the next one's was to like um, finding new and suitable locations for specialised collections. So this is the moving house part of that. Um, and the radio archive collection didn't did come with its own uh, location, but it was a temporary accommodation following the 2011 earthquake. Um, eventually, we had to move that collection from Christchurch to secure storage in Wellington, and this involved moving 90-year-old, extremely fragile audio discs on less than ideal back roads because the main road would be kept made impassable by the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake. So we had a couple of really big ones there. Um, another tricky risk comes in where you're finding suitable storage for specialised collections. And this, uh, this story state, dates back um, almost 15 years to where we had um, six tonnes of nitrate film originally stored by the New Zealand uh, with the New Zealand Army in a disused munitions magazine in Wellington. Um, but suddenly uh, we were given two months' notice and uh, we had to find, fortunately the Army did provide us with another magazine, but it was two hours' drive away. Um, this store had uh, no electricity and no climate control and conditions inside ranged from nearly freezing to up to 30 degrees in the middle of summer, with the humidity reaching the 90% range. Um, obviously, this was entirely unsuitable, and a serious fundraising campaign was undertaken that meant that we were able to build a specialist vault um, for nitrate film closer to Wellington within about three years. Uh, this provided much better conditions for the film and for the annual wine through. But things like nitrate film are tricky, and when the archive had to sell its own building, again due to earthquake risk, um, at least new premises. Um, as part of that uh, part of that lease conditions, um, we did actually specify that we would be able to work on nitrate film in the uh, in the new spaces, and this was agreed, and it was all entirely legal. But unfortunately, once we moved in, um, concerns were raised. Uh, I'm not sure by who, but um, insurance companies and consultants were brought in, and the upshot of that is that no nitrate film has been preserved for almost three years. So that's an unforeseen risk um, and an interruption to the preservation of one of New Zealand's most important and vulnerable audiovisual collections um, that really wasn't seen because we'd actually tried to organise for that risk but had um, not foreseen um, other ex additional parties becoming involved. The two stories I've just told about moving the materials to the country uh, and being exposed to poor conditions and then not being able to work on them subsequently have combined to make a really um, a poor situation where um, after the nitrate films have spent four years in the really in the poor conditions, we began to realise that there was some strange and new deterioration taking place. And so it was quite urgent to uh, be able to um, be able to work on those films and understand what was happening and to digitally scan them, which was our preservation method at the time. So that's where risks, complicate risks and changes can be fraught. Um, there's some there's occasional other stories that are, so some of the small details can trip you up. Um, and so I've just got another story on retrofitting buildings. Um, so again, going back a few years, when an office building was converted into storage for the archive. Um, the designer wanted the windows to look uniform and black. So um, black builder's paper was used inside the windows before the uh, uh, plasterboard was put up to create a vault. When the sun shone on these windows and was absorbed by the black paper, this created an intense hot spot that could actually be felt right through the walls of the vault. 
um, and this ultimately meant that we had to move any collection items away from the uh, away from the window uh, away from the walls of the vaults inside this, and um, eventually uh, the vaults had to be emptied and the plasterboard uh, ripped off and, re and the black lining replaced with something reflective. So the third bit in my disruption and distortions thing is the massive project, which, and this might be something that's been experienced by archives. Um, so you remember the massive collection, well, and we're only 10% of the budget. Fortunately, we were able to go out and gain funding uh, after, uh, well, quite a, a length of time, but finally um, gained funding with the support of other institutions to create a project um, to digitize magnetic media, and this was uh, started a couple of years ago. But a project on such a scale for an organization like the Archive um, brings risks of its own. And uh, one aspect is that it only targets one part of the collections, which means, which risks that other also important parts of the collections maybe wind up being neglected. Um, and if such a huge amount of money is spent on one particular project, um, it might be a little bit difficult to go back to funders and request further funds to uh, start to deal with the parts of the collection that have yet to be undertaken. So that is a risk that needs to be uh, notified and worked on. Um, one way of dealing with this um, has been to redefine the scope of the archives uh, collections. Uh, so actually narrowing it down, which is a good idea sometimes to be able to focus on what's really important. and. Um, an archival collection that has a focused selection policy is easy to understand and manage, but there is a risk of excluding valuable and interesting material if it doesn't quite fit. Um, but in this case, could be a funding-driven uh, uh, selection model. Um, and if you do decide to streamline your collections, then you can. Um, there is a risk of uh, throwing away or destroying um, archival material. Not so much that if the archive itself has chosen to remove this material from its collections, but the public perception of what it's doing needs to be very well managed. It can be a hard story to explain that much of this material is irrelevant or copies, or that it may be more easily accessed somewhere else. Um, the public just sees something that there's an archive throwing things away. So that's a risk that certainly needs to be managed. Um, it's also, um, the bad look can also extend to the disposal of materials like videotapes. Um, in a green world, an archive may look irresponsible if it fills a landfill with old VHS tapes. Um, and there is still no real way of recycling many of these kind of media materials that AV archives uh, deal with. It's an ongoing issue, I think, that um, there is no easy answer as Things like videotapes are complex mixtures of um, magnetic plastic, metal, etc., uh, not easily recycled. Um, second sort of big, big area of um, concern for the unforeseen risks is what I've called the new normal. And that's where you have um, stopgap stop measures, you know, things that you just do on the spur of a moment to, to make sure something works now. And then the workarounds um, that just stay. And um, this runs from the scale of leaving an archival box in a precarious or inappropriate place to leaving a collection somewhere less than optimal. And that would be the one, the best example of that would be the nitrate collection. Um, I have to say that um, leaving nitrate um, film stranded in the back of beyond it's not really usual to consider a chainsaw as an archival access tool. Uh, but here's our former collection manager cutting his way past a fallen tree so we can inspect the flooded vault. This is where the nitrate was before we built our specialist vault. Fortunately, uh, we did have some risk management there and everything was up off the floor. So the, the flood and the, uh, the slip and the subsequent flood had um, not caused any, any real damage and the landlord came and cleared away the slip about two weeks later. But we had to get in there to have a look. Um, another example would be the, those fragile audio discs that we moved from Christchurch. Um, there wasn't really a great space to, 
to put them, but we did find a climate controlled space and they sat on the floor of a, of a disused theatre um, attached as part of the archival building. Um, they couldn't fall any further, but it was pretty untidy and a bit of hard to access. And they've now been raised up off the floor onto proper shelving. But as last I um, remember, they were still lacking protective earthquake bars. So there's still a risk. Um, the job's not quite finished yet. In the same kind of vein, I think all archives have experienced uh, protective sheets like traditionally blue tarpaulins. Um, you've had a leak in a roof or somewhere or air, conditioning, um, air conditioning's leaking. Um, there was a vault that used to um, be underneath the, um, the cold vault and uh, uh, condensation would drip. It's um, when the blue tarpaulins stay uh, on on the shelves for a, a long time that you know you're in trouble, and that's because there's, they're still there because there's a lack of confidence that the problem or the leak has been fixed. Um, other temporary solutions that wind up becoming quite permanent would be include um, for collection storage could include shipping containers um, and you know the. We do have refrigerated ones, but are they dehumidified? And um, how long do you store things in shipping containers and still feel good about it? Um, another aspect to the new normal is settling for what can be done. Um, for example, you know, you're in an old building and the lift breaks down all the time. The staff can use the stairs, but what do you do if you're uh, trying to move collections or in fact, if you're a staff member with disabilities? Um, Another workaround is, um, and this is I also suspect is a common one, is that when the database is not reliable or isn't suitable for purpose, then um, various projects and other initiatives may resort to multiple spreadsheets with a great deal of information being stored in Excel. This can result in fragmented and siloed understanding of collections uh, with hard-won information not being found or not being linked to associated material. And I've seen some of these spreadsheets that, you know, have 10,000 lines or more, and that uh, becomes a little bit unwieldy. And eventually, put these into databases, but um, still waiting for those databases to turn up. And of course, our, our favourite and most recent one is COVID, um, which can be used as an excuse. So um, because of COVID, quite reasonably, uh, services have had to, had to have been restricted. Uh, people can't come in. People can't research collections as easily. Um, and if, if there's a lockdown, people can't work on the collections. However, this can can actually become the new standard and may well disguise um, the fact that staff shortages existed before COVID, or um, that an organisation may not have been coping. Um, and so you need, really need to be able to be transparent and clear about what is actually happening, even in times of COVID and with staff uh, resources and how you uh, are able to prov provide services to the public. Um, and a, a last one is um, resistance to change. So I'm not sure. Um, I used to believe that archivists were by nature reasonably conservative. Perhaps that was when I was a younger archivist surrounded by older ones. But one of the most exciting things about archiving for me has been the, the transformation into digital archiving, which presents an enormous change for the way it was always done, um, promising a new route to preservation that didn't involve wet labs and chemicals and very expensive um, outsourcing, and a far better way of providing access to collections. And you know, you only have to look at um, Tim's keynote address to see the, the amazing possibilities for somewhere as diverse as the Pacific. We could never have shared archival collections like that previously. But of course, there are also risks, especially when with such a massive transition into digital. Uh, and I've talked about the unforeseen consequences of delaying or putting aside actions. Um, sometimes there's good reasons for not um, urgent, there may be no money, uh, provenance needs to be sorted out. Nobody wants to put a huge amount of effort into something that may be outdated very soon. And this is certainly true of digitization projects. But um, I think the transition to digital archiving does actually present one of the greatest hidden, or maybe not so hidden, dangers for an archive. Um, a lot of 
emphasis is placed on transitioning analog collection items into the digital space so they can be saved and shared. And this is this is vital. You know, this is very very vital, very essential. Um, you know, as we know, magnetic media especially is um, coming to the end of its life. However, not as much thought may have been gone into promoting the long-term sustainability of digital storage. So our digital vaults, what are they really? You cannot simply put drives or data tapes on, shel on a shelf. The failure rate is too high and the tapes be may become inaccessible. And while servers for company servers are actively managed and have redundancy, they fill up very quickly when dealing with AV material. And so a lot of people have talked about cloud storage, but um, not quite sure what it really means. But this is what cloud storage really looks like. It is a massive amount of hardware and electricity, and it costs a lot of money to set up and maintain. And while um, cloud storage does come with the advantage of low upfront costs, but the substantial amounts of data that audiovisual archives accumulate can quickly become expensive to store in the cloud. There are also many questions. What does it cost to retrieve material? Will storage costs rise, especially over the course of a contract period or if a contract ends? You know, you're a little bit over a barrel if you suddenly um, decide that it's the right price has risen too much. What are you going to do with all your terabytes of data? Is cloud storage sustainable? And there's a lot of information about this, the amount of power and electricity, and where's that, that coming from? From oil and sustainable resources? And are your collections secure if they're being held in massive databases in another country, for example, managed by a private company? Most archives are uh, investing, I think, in data tape, LTO. Um, and this is uh, another major risk that I wanted to share, was if an archive does not have a plan that has been actively followed to migrate these tapes from one generation to the next, then a lot of preservation work can wind up trapped on an earlier generation of tape. For example, a generation three or four tape, which may have been what was actively being used five or six years ago, um, is now is a, con a situation where you need a, 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 an LTO five or six drive to be able to read those. But we're up to LTO eight or nine now, and they don't read back that far. So if those drives fail, just as Betacam uh, decks fail, or VHS decks are becoming rarer and harder to find, then those that material gets trapped on LTO4 or LTO3 tapes. Um, what this can mean, you, know, you can see the sweet spot there is all the green, um, and I uh, should have put dates on the introduction of those, but um, what it does mean is that materials that once had a lot of effort put into preserving them may, may be lost. Um, for example, magnetic-based uh, magnetic tape-based video or audio items that have since deteriorated and are no longer playable, or um, films that have succumbed to vinegar syndrome and been disposed of. The archivist responsible prioritised those materials knowing they were in danger, but may have unwittingly condemned them to be potentially lost anyway because they were transferred to an earlier generation of digital media, which is nevertheless on magnetic tape and it is getting harder and harder to retrieve. Many archives, perhaps small to middle size, will see the digitization of the audiovisual collections as a project, um, and for which they may not have the equipment or the skilled staff to undertake. And it's a one-off event, so they're sensible in not investing a lot of money to, in getting, setting up a process they will no longer be necessary once all their collections are converted. Um, and this means that you can get outsourced to a vendor and there are a number of vendors or indeed larger archives that could be partnered with to do this digitization process. As usually uh, you can convince funders to present some money for the cost of converting those files, but um, and there's usually some money put aside for the storage of those files. But the administration of those files is also vital. And here I come back to the database, a collection management system that is able to absorb a vast new set of archival materials 
directly related to the existing material. So that's where a very good collection management system is necessary, where you can tie the digital files to the original media. Losing files, misnaming them, attaching the wrong quality item, that can lead to a misplaced item being just as difficult to find in a digital storage system as a misfiled item in a physical vault. Uh, and I'd refer back here to the spreadsheets as well. One of the things being done with spreadsheets was that they have been actively worked on by multiple people in things like SharePoint, etc. But you'd find sometimes that lines would shift, the data would be entered in the wrong line. And unless you're really onto it, that can be detrimental to long-term understanding of what's happened. Um, the final major section here is actually about people and I did note in uh, Sally's um, introduction about uh, the people and the archivists and the passion that they have and I think that's absolutely true. Um, a decent sized audiovisual archive does tend to be an amalgamation of people from different backgrounds librarians, broadcast technicians, publicists, managers, often doing quite different jobs, but they nevertheless need to all work together. And those different jobs and the different ways of doing them can lead to misunderstandings or different time pressures. These issues can escalate and silos form, and when this happens, it's easier for miscommunication and mistakes to be made, leading to reputational damage and risk to the collections. Smaller archives tend to have people wearing multiple hats, and while the communication presumably should be better, the risk here is that many things get left for later and are never done, or the people involved risk burnout. Not many people arrive at a film archive as a fully trained audiovisual archivist or even archivist, and um, in-house training is essential and should be well structured to ensure a similar experience and level of understanding is reached by all participants. Um, new or junior archivists need to be supported and given effective and ongoing training, um, not just struggling through on-the-job training or, or a day or two at the start. Uh, all members of staff, including office staff, should have some training to give them a clear idea of what the organisation is actually all about and what they're trying to do. Um, and this could be the reverse as well. Archivists should know what the accountant or the reception has to deal reception has to deal with in order to be able to understand why when they say so, when they're rough or a bit gruff or um, short that they really shouldn't be and I think it's all about respect and trust. Um, with retention obviously um, as you really want to keep your archivists once they're trained. Pay is important and it's a bit difficult when truck drivers are earning a hundred thousand dollars a year to um, persuade a university graduate to accept less than half that as a starting wage. But again, it comes back to that people factor. And with audio-visual archive collections, working with them is not a common experience. There aren't many people you know, throughout the world who work in this area, even though audio-visual you know, seems to be one of the most dominant features of our um, modern culture. So often archivists are motivated by other factors, including the joy of working with these heritage materials and telling their stories, as well as being fairly unique in the fact that they are the ones working with audiovisual. What is not attractive and won't retain staff is poor culture. And like any other business, an archive needs to work hard to retain its skilled staff. So as well as trying to avoid silos or work-based disputes, um, the dynamics within teams but need to be held to a standard where there's no bullying or abusive behaviour, and that kind of thing cannot take hold. This requires transparent and open communications and a level of trust that any worker can talk freely. Um, it's very hard to build trust. It's the flip side of the coin to respect, and this should be a vital part of the kaupapa or principles of any organisation. It's hard to earn respect and trust, but it's very easy to lose it. When organisations do lose trust and there is a poor culture, then it can have a snowball effect. Um, some When key people leave and then there becomes a high level of turnover, morale drops, resulting in even more people departing and taking a great deal of knowledge and goodwill with them. Um, this was a problem with both the radio and the television archives when they came over to us with 
almost a dozen archival staff each, and unfortunately only uh, one remained from each uh, each organisation by the time I came to leave. As a cultural heritage organisation, this loss of knowledge can lead to a drift in purpose. If there is no oversight from a governing body or affiliated group, the original purpose of the business may change. This can be confusing because change is necessary for an institution to survive and thrive, but it can also disguise a change in purpose and move away from core values, practices and principles. We've already talked about the motivation for archivists, belief or inspiration. They want to be involved with heritage materials and the stories they represent. Um, this certainly applies to most of the employees in the archive. And it can be a mistake to allow or even restrict the engagement of staff to just want their own area. So conservators working on a piece of film or a videotape should be able to join in the telling of the story of that film and videotape as part of an online exhibition or blog. The publicist or web designer could make time and be invited to join in and working on actual collection items. I know that people often were very interested in looking at what other people were doing. Anyway, many, pro many potential problems, but hopefully ones that can be avoided. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to make about this uh, as being a, a talk about archival resilience and hidden dangers is that small mistakes can grow to be major issues. Um, and things that might seem minor at the time, especially when dealing with serious risks like earthquakes or dealing with um, inadequate budgets, can be overlooked, but they can't, they shouldn't be because they will be hard to correct later on. And it may be too late later on to be able to, there is no sense of going back and finding a, um, a solution if something is really lost. And all these small things, um, they do need to be fixed. To do that, somebody has to care. And so I think one of the things that would be useful is um, doing a risk register that is actually open and available. Most organisations have a risk register, but sometimes it's not open or transparent to all the staff. So that's uh, how to manage hidden subtle risks. So having a holistic approach where you understand your organisation as in its entirety so that everything is connected, everything has to work together, but not just within the organisation itself, but actually with the people around. So most archives are not too big that the CEO or even the would be able to be seen or heard on the shop floor. And if there's a board or a governance structure, then the people involved in that should also be seen and heard by the people working under their guidance so that there can be um, vertical integration of purpose and meaning in people feeling valued. Acknowledgement of all the staff people involved in a project or a piece of work is important and the organisation has to grow or change together. Um, major restructuring can have a very bad effect on an organisation, especially when there are no obvious benefits at the end of it, except for perhaps for top management to show that they're doing a job. Much better to have a clear vision of what is needed and move the organisation towards that in well-considered but less traumatic steps. And I speak as somebody who has been through three separate uh, restructurings over the last five years. And despite all that, the important thing is to build a positive attitude. Be confident that you can achieve plans before setting them out for staff. Archiving is a long game and sometimes it's hard to see progress. Setting up specific projects and celebrating their completion will help with this. And of course, that routine and working with heritage materials is what might be attractive to future archivists. The opportunity to work with heritage materials and tell stories will keep archivists engaged and working hard for the organisation. And we also need to be able to tell the story of the archive to outsiders. Who are the stakeholders? Can they see the value in the archive? And they should. And it's up to the archive to be able to tell that story. When the collection massively increased, it took a long discussion as to how to pay for the preservation of the material. The successful budget bid meant a large amount of funding for a four-year project to save magnetic media. And that was a story that was told successfully. It took 
a while to share that story, but it also involves bringing on partners to be able to work with the archive, and that included other heritage institutions as well as commercial vendors to support the project. Connecting with the outside world is also vital, and many audiovisual archives are operating in something of a vacuum in their own cities and countries because they are so specialised. But organisations such as Sapava provide a valuable sounding board showing that you're not alone, and never more so now than when the pandemic can have an isolating effect. But the internet can help with that. I must admit that in my, the early days of my archival career, it was no easy answer to technical problems available on the internet. It was, there was no internet. Yes, that old. These days, there is often still no easy answer on the internet, but at least it's there, and you'll certainly be able to find a bunch of people wrestling with the same issues and know you're not alone. So you need that connection. Finally, archiving is by definition a long-term activity. There will be many threats and issues that will arise in an uncertain world, but recognising and then facing that as a team and as a community will lead to better outcomes. And that's what I would encourage. Openness, transparency, good communications, and feeling that it's very worthwhile. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Jamie. I'm glad that my uh, technical issues have been resolved. I suspect it was user error. Lots of insights there. Um, thank you for sharing. So our next bit, and sorry, I should belatedly introduce myself. My name is Jackie Ullman. I'm Head of Collection at the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia. I come to you from the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal people here in Canberra. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, our next speaker is Lauren Sorensen. Um, lovely to see you on screen, Lauren. I'll just do a quick introduction and then uh, we'll pass over to you for your um, presentation on digital preservation um, and you're going to share uh, your learnings on that. Um, so Lauren works as Digital Projects and Data Manager at Stanford University Library's Digital Library System and Services Unit. Um, she's previously worked as, uh, or previously held positions in the Bay Area Video Coalition, Library of Congress, the Digital Preservation Outreach and Education Network, and she's also worked as a consultant with the City of Los Angeles, Glenstone Museum and the Whitney Museum of American Art. She's served on the Association of Moving Image Archivists Board of Directors, and she's a contributing author to the 2021 publication Archival Accessioning. She holds degrees from New York University in Moving Image Archiving and Preservation and from the University of California. So welcome, Lauren, and thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Jackie. I really appreciate everyone who's invited me here and supported me through this process. Um, I'm a little bit new to this platform, so I'm hoping that my slides will show up eventually. Um, I'm just going to share my screen right now here. Um, sorry about that. I'm coming into a little bit of trouble here. Um, just going to do my preferences. Did you see the uh, tap the two bar? below the screen and they have this screen share okay yes. yeah i think i just have to enable a permit permissions um one second here try and do this on mm, 
Lauren, if you want to drop it into the chat, um, I could try to share my screen. Okay. Um. If you just go to the... Um, oh, that'd be great, yeah. If you go to the chat bubble, which is on the bottom right side, and then you'll mm -hmm. see in the green box there's a chat you can drop it into. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, do my best between Sandra and I. Okay. Oh, for some reason I can't upload. Um, let's see. Um, let me just try one more thing here. Um, okay. Good. Um, yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Oh, yes. Wonderful. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much again to Sanche and to Karen and everyone um, who's invited me to be here. I'm really excited to be be here, and I've always wanted to attend Zabava, but hopefully in some future future um, session I'll be able to attend in person. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about digital preservation for audiovisual materials. Um, I'm going to be taking quite a kind of a practical approach to what we're what we're discussing. So we're going to be going through uh, a bit of a process oriented approach. Um, but first, I want to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva people, otherwise known as Los Angeles, California. Um, so yes, uh, next slide, please. Oh, that I'm, I'm doing the next slide, sorry. <laughs> One moment, <laughs> there we go, all right. Um, so we're gonna be doing a process-oriented approach here. So I'm gonna be going through and talking about identification of audiovisual materials, um, then associated risk factors with those audiovisual materials, going over some vocabulary, which has to do with um, file formats and characteristics of files that might seem confusing initially, I'm hoping to provide some clarity around those and have a discussion around um, file formats in that in that section. Um, digitization planning, again, that's kind of a, has to do with file formats, but also the environment that you're working in when you're pursuing digital preservation, um, all of the kind of different steps that are involved. And um, we have a limited amount of time, so, you know, there isn't a ton that we can go, go over here. So I wanted to make sure to include resource pages so um, I use these from a past workshop that I've taught about digital preservation. Um, my job right now, I'm mostly focused on project management. So my wonderful colleague, um, Andrew Berger, is the actual repository specialist for uh, Stanford University Archives, uh, Stanford University Libraries as a whole. Um, and so he is kind of like, um, you know, the digital preservation uh, guru that we have there now, but um, I'm drawing kind of on my past experience and also some work that I'm going to be collaborating with him on um, in the future because I've just started this new position um, with Stanford in January. So we're working on um, a lot of kind of like access components at this point. So I won't be referencing my actual job uh, very much, but just to say that wanted to shout him out. So. Um, so we'll move on to audiovisual format identification. So audiovisual format identification is a really key process in, in doing this work. Um, I wanted to, uh, to give you a sense of what's out there and the kind of differences between, you know, an analog example versus a digital example. Um, you know, this might be old, old news to you, but I wanted to kind of cover it so that we could then have a conversation a little bit more broader later. So uh, video, uh, half-inch open reel, very high at risk um, media. That was um, one of the first uh, open reel, half-inch open reel was one of the first portable uh, video devices that were, was available to filmmakers, um, in the, at least in the United States. And um, I believe internationally, but um, I could be wrong. My, my expertise is being drawn from my, of course, my, my area, which is in, um, in the United States. So, um, and then three-quarter three enchumatic, you might be familiar with all of these. Um, film, audio, and then digital examples. So this, in this case, this is like physical media where 
uh, digital files or you know digital encoding has been laid onto this onto these devices, right? So mini DV, DV, DVD, DVDR, things like that. I'm going to talk a little bit slower. I've been told so. Sorry about that. Um, and I just wanted to throw up a little bit of an example of film, um, just so you can see what we're what we're kind of discussing here. Um, Open Real. This is a, an example um, screenshot taken from the Texas Commission on the Arts uh, Resource Guide, which is an extremely useful tool. It's um, from the early 2000s, so it's a, a bit um, a bit from a while ago, but it's still super useful for archives to um, to reference. And Mona Jimenez um, was one of the authors. I can't remember right now the co-author on this. I apologize for that. But, um, but this is a really great way of kind of um, identifying what's in your collection and also seeing when the dates in use were. So you can identify, okay, this is a very old tape. This is something that I need to prioritize for digitization right away or, you know, things like that. Or like Jamie was talking about, maybe I need to go and look at the provenance for this material, things like that. So, so incredibly useful resource, um, I use it constantly uh, in past positions and in consulting. Um, so I wanted to shout out this. Also, the, this guide includes some, some basic measures that you can take to preserve the actual analog physical media. So um, beyond what we're talking about today, but this is kind of like a very simple step that you can take to take the record mode button off. Audio. So I just wanted to throw up some some examples of audio um, and collection ID. This preservation self assessment program collection ID guide I also find incredibly useful. It is um, one of these resources that's actually pretty current. It's pretty. It was pretty recent, recently made, um, and audio can definitely like come in groups. So there can be different tracks that are recorded on separate physical media. So it's important to kind of pay attention and look at the markings on the tape and research the history of the production as well. So having a familiarity with production can help you enormously in this, in this scenario. Um, consider if it makes sense to master to one file the multiple recordings as funding allows or if the master is somehow lost. Um, also important to track things like inches per second, IPS, that's something that you know, might be one of those things that you see on a tape and you don't know what it is. So that's what that is. Um, it's often notated on a housing for, for analog tape, excuse me, especially for older production materials. So I'm gonna kind of dive in here with the digitization risk factors, priorities from what we just talked about. Um, so one of the one of the first steps I would take in, in doing this any kind of evaluation on digitization priorities and risk factors is to create a basic inventory. So it's kind of like you're accessioning, right? Unless you already have an accessioning process, it really gets at this kind of like very bare, basic bare bones um, sort of a document that you can share with your colleagues and um, and move forward from there, right? It kind of gives you a grounding point. Um, so you can have like an ID number, you can put a title, primary art, author, artist, format, notes on condition, generation. So we'll go over generation a little bit later, but as a term, but I just wanted to shout that out. Um, identification, evaluation, inspection, this we kind of talked about in the last few slides. These are two really good resources for that. Um, the PSAP uh, collection ID guide includes not just um, video, and so it includes audio, it includes uh, still materials, photographs, paper, things like that. So there's a lot um, that you can do with the, that, um, that guide. Um, analog video, um, prioritize it based on age and condition. I would say if you have any analog video that is of, of, of importance to your organization or your mission, um, digitize it now. <laughs> um, don't wait if you can. Um, if you have the funding, of course, there's always funding that to think of, but um, equipment obsolescence is a major, major issue, um, as we'll talk about a little bit later too when we talk about file formats. Um, equipment obsolescence is something that, uh, you know, manufacturers no longer produce these machines, right? So they, they no longer produce the machines, so it's really difficult to be able to acquire them. And we, as, as you know, stewards of this material, we have to then kind of, you know, create relationships with people who have this, this equipment, 
um, we have to really prioritize this material. Um, it is also subject to sticky shed syndrome, soft binder syndrome, um, things like that. And analog audio is in a similar in a similar sense, um, has a similar um, obsolescence and it's made of similar materials. So it's subject to similar conservation risks and deterioration risks. Um, Tape-based digital media is another, another um, that you should really keep an eye out for and, and prioritize. Um, sorry about that. Um, DAP tapes especially are at great risk. Um, they, DAP machines don't always play all DAP tapes, so it's very kind of haphazard when you try and play back a DAP tape, um, what machine will play it back. Um, extremely fragile base on DV tape or metal evaporate, which is like the where the encoding lies basically. So it's very, very thin tape and it's very thin in width and in depth. So um, those are those are um, something that you that you want to think about prioritizing. Film, of course, film is subject to vinegar syndrome, um, fading, brittleness, and breaking. Um, a lot of the time, film, um, if you're working with family or family uh, collections or artist collections, those can be like maybe the only copy of those films. You know, reversal stock film, um, things like that. So it's important to keep keep an eye out on that. Um, optical media is also at risk. Um, of scratching primarily and die fading from recordable discs. So DVDRs and CDRs are composed of the, the, the material that's actually read off of the mechanism that reads the, the disc. Um, it reads it as if it was die. So it's, it's these little points in the die that, that, that's created. So um, that can easily fade in the sunlight and um, ink seeping through is another, another uh, factor. Um, obsolescence is a factor for mini discs. Um, mini disc players are few and far between at this point. All right, so we've we've done our prioritization. So now I'm going to move on to um, some some uh, discussion of what to do next. So how you will um, discuss uh, how to, you know, go go with a vendor. What questions you want to ask them and also in-house digitization. So any kind of questions you want to ask for your in-house in -house, uh, digitization setup, if you have the ability and technical knowledge to do that, um, or the resources out there, or community out there that can help you do that. So um, digitization vendors, um, I'm just gonna go through a few of these. This is, I'm, gonna, I'm happy to share my slides after um, because I know this is text heavy, but I wanted to go through a couple of these. Um, so you want to look for what formats they can handle, what experience they have. Um, you want to think about um, concerns about any digitization concerns you might have, any flaking or smell or deterioration you've noticed. See if they have the expertise to say, hey, I think I know what that is. Um, description of their inspection and cleaning procedure. Um, is there a plan for tracking any damage upon receipt? And um, of course, you know, technical or procedural metadata you want them to provide. So any kind of information that you want to, to get from them, are they able to provide that? Um, that's very important. And especially with analog video, do they incorporate a time-based corrector? Do they have one? Do they use it? Um, that can be pretty important, especially if you're working with very old tapes. That really has an effect on the quality. And of course, in-house digitization is another option. So if you have the technical expertise, if you're interested in it, you want to kind of dive in um, into that more technical realm. Um, you know, one question, of course, to ask is, do you have the technical expertise in-house and what can be outsourced? So maybe you want to split it up, right? Maybe you want to do mini DV at your organization and you want to outsource all of the half-inch open reel because that's very, very fragile. Um, what equipment can you source from your organization, eBay or otherwise? Um, can you identify deteriorated materials that might need special treatment? Um, for example, you know, something that's been affected by mold or vinegar syndrome, do you know to separate that out? Things like that. Um, what software can produce file formats which fit your specifications? Um, technical or procedural metadata you want to capture, um, have that set up. All right, so I'm going to go into digital preservation vocabulary, which is sort of a vocabulary discussion, but also about kind of like file formats and lossy versus lossless, things like that. 
So this image is actually from video art pioneer um, Woody Vasulka. Um, it's called Digital Vocabulary. Uh, I thought it would mirror what we're talking about. Um, file formats um, is an important question. So I wanted to, you know, kind of dive into that here. Um, and I wanted to point out too that digital preservation is really a process. It's not something that ends. So in terms of like film to film preservation, there's a good chance that you could leave the film on the shelf. If you've done a preservation project on it, you can leave it on the shelf for any number of years, 20, 50, 20 25 years. And if it's a polyester base, you're gonna be okay. Um, but digital preservation is not in that same sense, right? It's, it's, it's a process. It's something that has a life to it. It's helpful to think about it. I find it helpful to think about it as a life cycle. So there's no one activity that comprises preservation. Um, it, some people think that, oh, you know, storage, that's what preservation is, digital preservation is. It's actually more than that. It's a series of actions, of policy, of a commitment to policy and a commitment of resources. Um, so it's really kind of like more of an ecosystem of decisions and tasks that are made by an institution. Um, and of course, um, in terms of just defining digital, you know, it has a lot of definitions in our culture at this point, but what we are referring to in this lecture is in contrast to analog. So like I said before, I kind of want to be as practical and, and useful as possible in this presentation. Um, so digital is either stored on storage devices like hard disk drives, floppy disks, flash drives, and so on. Um, it's also encoded onto tape, like we talked about before in our, in our example there. So what is a codec? Uh, a codec is contained within a wrapper or container of a digital file. For digital video, it is common to have two codecs indicated in the file, audio, and video. Um, characteristics in or defined by the codec may be compression, so lossless or lossy, which we'll discuss in a second, um, color space, aspect ratio, resolution, and so on. And in terms of a container or a wrapper, um, an information stored in a container or wrapper can be a, uh, the information that tells the audio and video when to sync up. It can also um, capture embedded metadata. So the user or the collection manager can embed information into that file sometimes for, for particular types of, of wrappers. Um, I'm thinking in particular of MXF. That's one, one, file, one um, file wrapper that can, can hold, uh, hold uh, embedded metadata. So lossy versus lossless codecs is a really important discussion, especially because with video and audio um, materials and film too, scan film, um, there's often just a lot of file storage that's used. So when, especially when you're working with uncompressed, excuse me, um, you're working with uncompressed uh, files that can be really high um, cost of storage to, to store those materials or, you know, not, always really high, but you know, it can be, it can be something to think about definitely and kind of strategize with your colleagues about. Um, so I wanted to define lossless compression. So lossless compression, this is a definition that comes from Mozilla. Lossless compression is a class of data compression algorithms that allows the original data to be perfectly reconstructed from the compressed data. So losslessly compressed methods are reversible and the quality is not degraded. So you can see in this graphic that you have the original, you've compressed it, and then you decode it again and you get the original. With lossy compression, if you're going to compress it, it's gonna become, and you're gonna try and decode it again back to that original format, it's not gonna be the same. It's not gonna be the same um, type of, of, of file. It's gonna lose a lot of the characteristics of that file. It's gonna lose resolution it's gonna lose um, what, you know, depending on the file format, it depends on how, what it's going to actually lose, but, but definitely lose in quality. So it's really important to keep in mind for archives and museums in, in particular. There are applications for lossy formats that are useful though, um, but they're not often seen in a preservation environment. For example, MP4 movie file formats are used for access type files for streaming or otherwise available online to save space and storage costs associated with streaming. 
end use. And this is a lossy codec. Um, and also, if you know, the only available file that you can find, or say you receive a collection where the originals are MP4s and MP4s or any lossless codec, losslessly compressed codec. Um, one nice way of working with these files is to normalize them. That you'll see, you'll hear this term a lot if you're going into the kind of digital preservation world. Um, normalize them to a preservation format. Um, for audiovisual materials, this is commonly either you know uncompressed V210 codec um, with a PCM in an MOV wrapper, um, or one uh, combo that has been um, studied a lot in our community lately is FFE1 and LPCM in a Matroska wrapper. Um, FFE1 is a lossless video codec and it's open source, um, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Um, and FLAC is another example of a losslessly compressed codec, which is an audio codec. Um, you can also make the decision to keep them in their original format if the codec and wrapper are widely adopted. Okay, and I wanted to go over um, generation quickly because we did talk about that in, uh, previously. Um, so generation is a sort of similar occurrence to the term lossy and lossless. It's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty important when you're, when you're looking at digitizing video and, and assessing um, a uh, collection of video, um, video in particular, but also film. Um, and it's important to know that because it gives you a sense of where it is in the quality uh, pr in the production process. And it also gives you a sense of what the quality is. So a generation refers to source material from analog video or audio tape, which indicates the type of material recorded in terms of its status in the process of recording or production. So for example, camera original, is a generation which is the highest quality. Um, but following editing and laying down the tape to a master, then the master is the highest quality of that version, if that makes sense. So you're editing it down. You're, you're not gonna use all of that camera footage that you've shot, but you're gonna edit it down and you're gonna have a master from that. So the camera original loses a generation of quality after editing to the master version in analog production settings. Um, so, and I also wanted to shout out this resource, um, AV Artifact Atlas, which is a really useful um, tool for identifying artifacts that may come back with, with um, your uh, digitized files and that you might want to initiate a conversation with your vendor or with your digitizing technician around, you know, why did this artifact show up and what can we do about it? How can we, is there a possibility of fixing it? Things like that. Um, they also have a definition of generation here, which is not too far off from what we were talking about too. Which brings us to um, open formats versus proprietary. I'm gonna talk a little bit slower here, sorry. Let's see. All right, so um, I'm gonna go with the open data handbook um, uh, definition for right now. Um, a proprietary file format is one that a company owns and controls. Um, data in this format may need proprietary for software to be read reliably. Not always, but it may need it. Um, unlike an open format, the description of the format may be confidential or unpublished and can be changed by the company at any time. Proprietary software usually reads and saves data in its own proprietary format. For example, very common example, um, different versions of Microsoft Excel use the proprietary XLS and XLSX formats. So there are different schools of thought in the archiving world. Um, mostly broadcast and commercial media archives are interested in proprietary formats, um, though some do use open formats. Um, they have a need to protect their assets with digital rights management uh, that can be attached to a proprietary file format, or they are just more interested in using commercially built products for whatever reason. Maybe they have more of a budget for that, or they need um, technical support that they can't have on site. Another reason is wide adoption. So you'll see a lot of archives and museums who adopt MOV as a standard wrapper format, even though it is technically proprietary to Apple. So it is widely adopted. So the risk of it, you know, being coming obsolete is lower, much lower actually. But um, you know, it is an it is technically proprietary to Apple, though the specification is open. At this point, it's open. Who knows five or ten years from now if it will be open. 
Um, I wanted to include a couple of definitions so you can get a real sense of the debate. Um, for what it's worth, I fall on the side of open source and community driven work in this area because it encourages transparency for staff who come next. Um, which I think is an important overall principle in our cultural heritage information field. Um, for example, it's the reason for open community maintained metadata standards, such as like Dublin Core, EB Core, things like that, um, in, in that you can access, use, and understand them over time. So it's kind of like a corresponding um, plus for those. Um, these definitions focus on formats, but software and hardware can also be built in a proprietary manner or with restrictive rules in, on use. In fact, the whole issue with aging analog videotapes is obsolescence. So it is almost a corresponding situation to that. In 50 years, for example, will Apple mass produce software which can read a movie files? That's a question, we don't know. We can't know what will happen 50 years in the future. We know what happened with videotape playback manufacturers, however, um, in that they no longer produce these machines because they can't make money off them. So archives and museums have to support these businesses and work to educate ourselves in order to maintain very old equipment so that we can digitize and preserve this type of material. This is one of a number of reasons analog video digitization to high, high quality preservation files should be a top priority. So another term that I'll go over quickly is um, checksum and file fixity. So you'll see these, um, if you're diving into digital preservation at all, you'll, you'll really um, see this quite a lot. Um, so a checksum, a fixity check is a mechanism to verify that a digital object has not been altered in an undocumented manner. Um, checksums, message digests, and digital signatures are examples of tools to run fixity checks. So in that sense, a uh, checksum is an algorithmically computed numeric value for a file or set of files used to validate the state and content of the file for the purpose of detecting accidental errors that may have been introduced during its transmission or storage. So it's basically a check on the integrity of data um, and it can be really useful. And um, there are several types of algorithms out there. You might, might hear MD5, um, SHA-1, SHA-256, um, things like that. So digital preservation resources. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over these um, and then we'll have um, some time for, for questions. Um, I know this is kind of a lot to, um, to be presenting here, but um, yeah. So digital preservation, National Digital Stewardship Alliance has a levels of preservation document that I think is probably the most useful document for this kind of work. Um, it really gives you a sense of the different functional areas. So in this example, it's storage um, and then the level. So you might not, you might be just starting out. So you're at level one and maybe you've gotten a little bit further in your process and you're at level two. So you're describing your material a little bit more or you have more, more than one copy in a different geographical location with different risk factors. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very nice um, model because it kind of is almost like meeting you where you are. You know, it's really like reviewing these as closely as you can, I think is just very, very useful and kind of gives you a sense of, you know, where can I actually start and what are the tasks that, that will bring me there? Um, the OAIS reference model um, is something that you'll also see if you're diving into this type of work. Um, it's been criticized in the field for its kind of strict guidance, especially regarding audience and it's kind of like space data origins. Um, but I like to see, I like to think about OAIS, Open Archival Information System, as specifically as a reference model. I use it as a tool to be able to communicate in pol about policy in meetings and about technical things without having to really dive into the technical details. So it really helps me around documentation and communication. Um, and I think that's a really useful way of, of working with it. Um, for example, um, in the next slide, um, you can see that this is an example of an AIP, which is an archival information package. And this is something that you know we, we designed it. when I was working at Bay Area Video Coalition, we designed this as like a series of little kind of micro scripts that were run on the files that we received from our digitizing technicians. Um, 
And so you can see there's a lot of metadata here. There's information about the FF probe is a really interesting tool to, to extract metadata from a file. Um, there's also the technical metadata that was um, built in from the digitizing technician. Um, there's premise, and that's a digital preservation metadata schema. And there's media info, which is also a really invaluable tool. Media info, I'd highly recommend checking that out. Um, they also do a lot of really great community work around file formats and FFV1 as well. And then you can see we have the objects. So they have the objects in a separate file folder and directory. So like I said, it can be really helpful as a way of communicating and seeing, OK, what's, what's, what am I expecting back from the vendor in terms of an archival information package? What do I want to create once I get it into the archive? Do I want to include this kind of metadata? Do I want to include that kind of metadata? That sort of thing. So it can be really helpful for that. And I just wanted to quickly go um, give you a sense of, like I said, with media info, it's a really useful tool. I might really encourage you to check it out. Um, larger, it can be, all of these tools can be included in kind of like larger digital software packages. So, you know, if you're at all um, intimidated by this or, you know, it seems too technical, um, there are also people that can help you and, you know, out there in the community. And there's also, you know, these are, these can be part of larger larger software packages. Um, so file format validation goes along with the idea that you can't know something as a certain format just by its file extension. So it's important to know that some validation tools don't work as well with audiovisual, um, and some are known for working excellently with it. Um, so Media Info is one that works very well with AV. Um, Jehove is another one that works well with audio. Um, an EXIF tool is one other very commonly used um, extractor tool, but that works mostly with um, still images and documents, but you can run it through um, audiovisual files as well. Um, and you can see here too that there are tools to document structure of, of, um, of a file system, like so, you know, a structure of say you've got a hard drive and you're, you're going to um, be ingesting it into your into your digital repository or just making a copy of it, you know, you might want to create a um, document which gives you a sense of like, what's there? What am I working with? What are the, what are the directories and where, how did it come into us from the donor? And then quickly, I just wanted to go over um, a couple of preservation metadata um, schemas that I encourage you to investigate. Um, if you're going into this work. Um, PB Core is one um, that works with instantiation. So basically like there's one descriptive unit and then there can be multiple different versions of that. So a physical, a physical tape, a digitized physical tape and so on and so forth. Um, and that descriptive unit can describe, you know, the title and the, the actresses and artists and things like that. Premise is a schema that's maintained by Library of Congress and this is primarily um, the, I'd say the main uh, digital preservation uh, schema that's out there for metadata. Um, and it's really interesting and it's, it's useful for tracking what happens to a file over time. So you can track and as an event when you check a checksum, for example. And METS is another um, really useful tool that's commonly seen in um, digital preservation. Uh, metadata encoding and transmission standard. And it's mostly, I've seen it used as a wrapper. So it wraps premise and some other kind of descriptive metadata into a, into a container. So it kind of contains it and lets you know what's there. Um, wrapping, the, wrapping and associating together the descriptive and technical information. So just quickly, I wanted to go over storage media. I really appreciate what Jamie said about Cloud storage, I completely agree. Cloud storage is just hard drives somewhere else. <laughs> um, I think that's a really, actually a really important um, thing to consider when you're practically going through this, this um, process. Um, and and uh, like, like Jamie said, you know, the cost of retrieving um, media from a cloud storage uh, vendor can be quite costly. And it's important to like, outline those costs for yourself and and know what's out there. Um, fortunately, a lot of these cloud storage vendors have a lot, a lot of documentation online. Um, 
But there's also, um, I put in the slides, <clears throat> excuse me. I put in the slides another report by a consulting firm that um, has to do with cloud storage vendor profiles. So it gives a sense of how cloud storage might be um, useful for institutions that are cultural heritage based, um, which I find really, really useful. Um, you can also consider that their data store, their data, <clears throat> excuse me, data centers might be in different geographic locations. And that can be good <clears throat> to document in your uh, metadata. Uh, server, so server attached storage. Um, so this requires um, someone who has systems administrator expertise. Um, I think that's what it's called, at least in the United States. Um, so you're someone, who, it's someone who is um, basically able to handle maintenance and someone who does security updates to the operating system software that the server is run from. Um, and can also do permissions. So oftentimes a systems administrator is responsible for giving access. So that's very important, you know, who, who has access to these drives and what's the security level. So it can be somewhat costly, um, but you do have a way of really directly checking checksums whenever that is deemed appropriate um, or whatever your policy ends up saying that you want to do it on certain intervals. Um, external hard drives. So the need to power up um, periodically to test for drive failure. That's very important. This is probably the lowest cost version of what we're talking about here. Um, and the lowest, uh, you know, ramp up in terms of what your, um, you know, uh, expertise would be. So, you know, you can also send like maybe you have a partner organization that's in another country. You could perhaps send a copy of that hard drive to them and document it in your in your collection management system, things like that. There's all sorts of all sorts of ways of, of doing this work. So um, I encourage you to to be creative um, and also, you know, thoughtful and documented and things like that. But I think it, it does require a certain amount of creativity to, to kind of do this work, I believe, especially since it's so new to all of us. And um, and yeah, I think it, we have a really great community around it too. So that's something to draw on as well. Um, so LTO, like Jamie said, you know, it's data tape. You really have to move the files off and onto live storage in order to verify checksums, which can be a barrier. Um, you also have to migrate every five to seven years. Um, LTO drive generations one through seven are able to read tapes from two generations prior and are able to write to tapes from one prior generation. So that's just something to keep in mind. You know, um, I know that there have been instances of archives that have, um, you know, that has been a, an issue because, you know, they have turnover and staff and something isn't documented where you're the, or the technical expertise that they once had, someone left and went to another job, um, that kind of thing can be a, a factor in, the, in considering that. All right, and so um, I'm going to just briefly go over what the resource pages are. Um, these are basically for you to look at later. Um, I wanted to include as much information as possible and make this kind of like a little bit workshop style. So um, I'm hoping this will be useful to you. Um, so this is uh, target formats and digitization. Um, so this is discussing the different um, kind of categories of audiovisual material and different types of specifications that are um, outlined by the community. And also just basically reading that you can do about setting up a archive, digital archiving workstation, things like that. Um, OAIS and this TDR certification, I don't think that I mentioned TDR, Trusted Digital Repository Certification. Um, this is again, kind of like a, a standard practice, but it's really something that only a few university archives even have have gotten. So it's really shouldn't be a barrier to, to do what you need to do as far as digital preservation goes. Um, but it can be interesting to look at and um, study. So I included um, links to that. Uh, digitization process. So this is um, this is a, um, in particular from what we talked about. These are sort of uh, information that this comes from the community that you can use when you're setting up a digitization station or you're choosing to outsource your material. Um, so there's a really useful open workflows um, documentation on GitHub um, and via open source. Um, I helped found this uh, hack day that happens every year or year, every year pre-pandemic um, 
uh, called uh, AMIA DLF Hack Day. And so we have a lot of resources on AMIA open source if you want to go to this link to um, to see what what else is out there if you're kind of more tech oriented or not. You know, there's there's also documentation uh, work on there too. Um, so vendors, uh, this is on another useful documentation, uh, another useful document um, towards um, helping you create an RFP and which is a request for proposals and um, that kind of thing. Um, minimal viable digitization station. I think this is incredibly useful. Um, this was prepared by Ashley Bluer and a bunch of people um, from the community contributed to it. Um, and this is just a very, you know, basic setup for digitizing audiovisual material. Um, and it's on Google, Google Docs, so it's open for everyone. And then I have some um, links to video playback deck refurbishment vendors. <laughs> my, my area is primarily video and movie image, so I don't have audio, I apologize, but um, you can definitely look at, at, at these different resources and maybe even contact these people to see, hey, you know, do you have, do you have references to other, other vendors um, in that more than that realm? Um, so digital preservation policy examples. These are kind of where you outline, you know, what your plan is um, and what you're you're hoping to do with your digital preservation planning. Um, yeah, and then storage. Um, so this is kind of like that's that vendor profile that I was talking about before. Um, PASIG is a really good organization to become involved with that um, has like a kind of a preservation storage bent. Um, so we included the link there. And then software for digital preservation. So these are kind of more overarching softwares that you can use. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know, some of them are vendors that um, might not offer services in um, in Southeast Asia. And I don't, I, I didn't do the research to know that and I apologize, but um, you might be able to contact them and say, see if there are um, vendors that are associated with them that might be in your area. And then I also included a link to collection management system collection. This is another, um, resource brought on by um, Ashley Bluer. Um, and this really gives you a sense of collection management systems, but it also includes some digital asset management systems and digital preservation systems and their characteristics and what the community kind of thinks of them. So that can be really useful to look at. And then more information about metadata, and then that's it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and I'm happy to answer any questions and also of course share um, my slides afterwards. Great. Thank you for that, Lauren. Um, I think given the time we've got, uh, we do have one question in the um, Q&A and I noticed that lots of people have been putting their questions into the room. Thank you very much for that. And um, I know Jamie has answered some of them already. Um, one of the questions, Lauren, was if we could have the slide deck um, shared. And I, I know you said you would do that. I'll just um, quickly uh, ask a couple of quick questions that have come in. One of them is from Rosaline, and she's asked about how digitization is done and whether it would go internal or external. I know that you did talk about that in your presentation, but then she asked a follow on around um, how to manage staff expertise in handling the digital uh, digitization work processes. Just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think um, I will definitely share my slides. So there are some um, questions to consider on two of those slides around um, deciding if you want to be doing it internally or externally. Um, I think that's a great question around managing staff expertise. I really have, I've worked at a lot of places that have done really good documentation of their workflows. And I think that's enormously helpful. Um, and it can be really um, just, and immensely helpful for, for everyone coming down the line, but also for people for, you know, communicating internally to different stakeholders in your organization. So, you know, from management down to, you know, digitizing technician, um, it really gives a gives it a, a sense of like, okay, this is what we're what we're working with and, and where we want to go with it. Um, it can be something as simple as a policy document, but I think digital work processes really requires more kind of like maybe a wiki or something like that. At Stanford, we use a tool called Confluence, which is like kind of like a wiki, but um, you know, it's like a, yeah, a way of documenting our processes and, and people can, can share it and can um, edit it and it, it tracks the editing um, that's been done on it, which is really nice. 
Um, so yeah, I just really encourage documentation a lot. That's great. Thank you. And yeah, we find at the NFSA too, just um, skills transfer, adapting to have the skills we need as formats evolve and technology evolves, but also making sure that there's knowledge transfer happening is, is really um, important. And it can drop by the wayside when people are busy, but um, yeah, it needs investment. I have one more question. I know uh, Caroline has in the room chat, and I'd encourage everyone to have a look at it, has shared a great Australian resource, a free resource, um, which is around the management of First Nations. Uh, well, it's designed specifically with First Nations collection or cultural material and communities in mind. So that's the Makurtu or Mukatu platform. Um, there's a link there in the chat. But one final question, which I suspect might be for Jamie, um, is around the use of mould, um, uh, sorry, the use of alcohol to clean mould on, um, ah, there we go, Jamie, I see you actually answered it in the text, um, which is great. So I think that might take us to the end of our session. Um, and thank you for everyone. Thank you for your patience with, we had a few um, uh, logistical issues at the beginning, which is always the way to settling in. Um, that was great. Uh, and thank you, Lauren and Jamie, for sharing so much with us, um, your learnings. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Um, Sanchai, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thank you, Florence and Jamie. Uh, so we should press F to add clouds and <laughs> for you guys all. <laughs> Fantastic uh, section. So, okay, we come to the lunch break. Uh, we'll come back again for the symposium section two in one hour and a half minute from now. So I don't know where you are now, but in Thailand it's one thirty p.m. Uh, Thailand time. So calculate with your time zone different. See you later. The room is not closed, so you can have a chance to look around and talk with another people and see you again in half an hour and uh, an hour and a half sorry 90 minutes sorry okay thank you Roland. thank you Jackie, Jamie. thank you everyone bye bye, bye.